Let me introduce the little boy M case. This is a follow up from my previous build I called little boy S, where I asked you guys for your opinions and ideas for an upcoming build, and you guys really delivered, with hundreds of comments containing both great ideas and suggestions. And one of the words that kept coming up was MATX. By filtering out only comments containing the word MATX from my comments tab, the list was endless. So it's safe to say that this is a highly requested topic. Some of you may remember that I made a micro ATX case about two years ago on this channel. But it lacked one important feature, which is support for an ATX power supply. And I really wish I could fulfill all your requests, but unfortunately that's simply not possible in one single video. Though I strongly believe that this design will be of interest to quite a lot of you. Because this design features support for micro ATX and ITX motherboard, it's got room for 3 slot GPUs up to 300mm in length, it supports both ATX and SFX power supplies, as well as tons of hard drive space and room for some really big air coolers as well as 240mm liquid cooling support. All in a relatively small package that fits nicely into an on-desk setup. This M version of the case was designed using Shaper 3D and consists of many flat pieces just like my previous smaller version. The 3D models of the side panels are solid pieces, and these external patterns are made within the slicer instead of within the CAD program. To create these patterns in the slicer, we can take the exported STLs and import them into our slicer. In this example, I'll be using Prusa Slicer, but most slicers can do this. We start by going into our print settings, then to layers and perimeters, then we can set the top and bottom layers down to zero. And the infill can be set to any type you'd like as long as it allows air to pass through. I prefer honeycomb for this build at 20% density. I like to use about 3mm thick perimeters on builds like this, which with my 0.6 nozzle means 5 perimeters. This way we can make sure that our sliding tracks are extra strong and that the threaded inserts will get enough plastic to grip onto. The slice file will now only consist of walls and infill meaning it's ideal for airflow to pass through without having to create complicated CAD files. The case was printed out on my modified CR10, and here we're really pushing the print bed to its limits, with the largest parts of this case requiring the full 300 by 300 mm print volume, with absolutely no room to spare. All the printed parts for this case only weighs about 1.6 kilograms in total, which is not much at all considering the size of the case and what it can hold. Unfortunately, I had to take apart my recently built big boy case due to this project to reuse some of the parts, so it only got to be a few months old before retiring. But you gotta do what you gotta do with what you have, right? The coolest part of this design is how all the parts fit so seamlessly together. One part sliding into the other, and what's so cool about this is that the panels actually lock into each other meaning that the front panel will actually lock the three other panels into place, preventing them from moving. And then the top panel again will lock into place the front panel, with a latching feature preventing it from sliding back out accidentally. The external top panel will then slide into the same track on top of the internal top panel, followed by a magnetic front panel and we still have not used a single screw. And the only main body part requiring any screws to disassemble is the rear panel locking everything into place, allowing for this super clean exterior with no visible screws. In this build I'll be using a micro ATX motherboard and a 240mm AIO liquid cooler to cool the CPU. We start the build process by installing all of our motherboard standoffs. These simply tap themselves into the plastic holes like in most of my other recent builds, before being secured in place tightly with a tool. Next, our motherboard can be lowered into place and secured with the standard mounting screws. The bottom panel of the case consists of a flat and relatively thin part. This thin part is stiffened up by the feet, which are long and flat and cover the entire width of the case. And the reason for designing the feet long like this is to evenly distribute the PC's weight on the bottom panel, as it will carry the entire load. Each foot is installed using three 10mm M3 machine screws and these will just tap themselves into the plastic as they're only intended to be installed once. 
I found it beneficial to print the bottom part in separate pieces because of the print direction of the sliding tracks on the sides of the panel to eliminate any need for support material. Otherwise I would have just printed this in one piece but it was just more convenient to do it this way due to the rest of the design features. With the feet attached we can slide the bottom panel into the motherboard side panel. Once it's all the way in we can grab our opposite side panel and slide that into place the same way. Our internal front panel has a few mounting options and it was originally intended to be able to support up to two 120mm intake fans but this has later been updated to only one fan due to some issues I'll get into later. The front panel slides down into the two side panels and will partially slide into the bottom panel as well, locking it into place, preventing it from being able to slide back out of the track. We can now slide into place our internal top panel, which is the final piece of the puzzle locking everything together, allowing the internal chassis to stand by itself without any screws. And once all parts are connected and slid into each other, those slightly loose tolerances will be stiffened up. The side panel opposite of the motherboard has a sliding slot that can hold this multi-mounting plate. This plate is intended for multiple purposes like mounting hard drives, fans or a radiator. The hard drive mounts are designed so that they will use the existing M3 holes on the hard drive to attach it by using M3 by 10mm screws on both 3.5 and 2.5 inch hard drives. Once the preferred part is installed onto the plate, it simply slides into the chassis and will be locked in place later once the rear panel attaches. Optionally or additionally, if you want even more hard drives, there will also be another mount in the lower front part of the chassis that allows us to mount additional 2.5 inch hard drives using this track as well as these two mounting holes where we can install threaded inserts if we want to. This is optional and is only meant if you really need a lot of hard drives but I figured it'd be nice to have the option as the space would otherwise be empty. The mounting bracket has this 45 degree edge that will hook onto the other 45 degree edge on the mounting point and then it's secured in place using two M3 by 10 mm screws locking it into place. I chose to go for this 45 degree hook mount so the hard drive bracket could easily be added or removed just with front access at a later stage without having to struggle with small screw mounts in the middle of the chassis when the case is full of parts and cables. Though I do recommend sliding the front panel up a bit for easier access to this part. Back to the side mounted multi-mount, personally I won't be using hard drives here. I'll rather be using it for my 240mm NZXT liquid cooler. It simply mounts right onto the pre-made holes and slides right into place like a glove in a sock. As mentioned, the sliding plate locks into place once the rear panel is attached and the rear panel is secured in place using M3 by 10mm screws screwed into some threaded inserts that are carefully melted into each of the five mounting points, which we might as well melt into place right now, but these can also be melted into place before assembly if you rather prefer that. Before we can install our rear panel, we have to make sure our GPU is installed first. Here I'm using a Gigabyte 3070, which is roughly 290mm long and it fits with no problem. And just to prove it to you, you can actually use an ATX power supply in this case. But if you do use an ATX power supply, you are limited to graphics cards sticking out about 120mm from the motherboard at most, which is often referred to as graphics card height. The ATX power supply I'm using here is of the shorter type which is 125mm deep, but it should be able to fit the standard 140mm depth as well here, as you can see there's tons of space and even more space if you ditch the lower hard drive bay. Due to the power requirements of my personal system, I'll be using my SFX sized V850 from Cooler Master. Regardless of whether you're using an ATX or SFX power supply, the intake fan should be facing the outside of the case, as it's perforated so there's really no reason not to. As you can see, with a SFX power supply, you should be able to fit GPUs with a height of up to 150 millimeters as long as their length is shorter than 300 millimeters. I'm also planning on making a slimmer version of this hard drive bay to allow for extra space in the front of the case, in case you're using these really high graphics cards and also want to have some hard drives. The power supply simply attaches to the rear panel using four screws. Keep in mind that the SFX power supply and the ATX power supply use different rear panels, so make sure to select the correct SDL that fits your needs when printing. 
Before securing the rear plate into place, we also want to add a threaded insert for the graphics card. I'll only be using the upper PCI Express slot, so I only need one. But there are multiple holes for different height slots. The lower slots have been designed so that you can easily cut them away with some pliers if you need them for different expansion cards. The whole panel with the power supply then drops into the main body and is secured in place with 5 M3 screws. Remember to also secure the M3 screw for the graphics card. The rear panel has two more mounting holes up at the top. These are supposed to be attached to the top external panel, which has two corresponding holes for threaded inserts. When the rear panel is in place with the lower five screws attached, it actually acts as a support for both the side panels as well, meaning that the top and front panels can easily be slid out, allowing full access to all the internal components. If we also want to use bottom intake fans, now is a good time to install them. The bottom panel fits two 120mm fans and these drop into place below the GPU and are secured in place using regular fan screws through the bottom panel. There's also a spot for another 120mm exhaust fan that can be mounted here and it secures into place from the rear panel. Then it's simply a matter of installing all the necessary power cables into the correct ports and we'll end up with something like this. We still have room for even more fans. The front panel can, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, hold an intake fan here at the top. Either a 120mm fan or a 140mm fan. And originally the design was intended to support another fan down here, but that's been changed in the final design due to an issue I didn't catch during designing. The mount shown in the video is not the final fan mount, as it turned out to not be as practical as expected and will be slightly different in the final model, but with the same functionality. The front panel was also upgraded after filming this to support an additional 3.5 inch drive if you for example decide to use a liquid cooler and you'd still want to have the option of a 3.5 inch drive. The reason for removing the lower intake fan was due to a conflicting issue with the power button placement, as it'll sit down inside this notch here and the fan would be covering it, blocking its placement. I could have just moved the power button to allow for one more fan, but I decided that the fan wouldn't really make much of a difference anyway due to the two bottom intake fans supplying the GPU with more than enough fresh air. Before the front panel can be put back in place, we need to install the magnets that will hold the front panel in place. In my case, the tolerances were designed very tight, so I had to press fit them into place. But I've made the tolerances slightly bigger, so you may or may not need a drop of glue. There are a total of four magnets to insert, one in each corner. And if you have to push them into place, I recommend using something on the back of the printed part to push against so you don't damage the print. The internal top panel can now be slid back into place. And another cool thing here is that it's got these openings on the two outward facing corners of the tracks. These have the function of allowing the external front panel to slide on top. And by having these two pins, it will actually lock the whole assembly together as it will be secured in place from the back using screws. Our external front panel also needs magnet embedded to ensure a secure fit. This is done by adding a magnet to each of the four corners of the panel. And it's important that the pairs of corresponding magnets are attracted to each other. The easiest way to ensure the correct polarity of the magnets is to stick a magnet to the other magnet already installed. Then mark the outside with a sharpie. This way you'll easily know which side should face down into the hole on the opposite part. These were also pushed into place on my build but tolerances have been slightly adjusted, so depending on your printer, you may or may not need a drop of glue. If all the magnets are installed correctly, the front panels should just drop perfectly into place like this. The magnet mounts are also elevated a bit from the panel itself, serving a double purpose like guiding pins, making sure it can only be detached by pulling it straight out, making it very secure. The only thing left to install now is our power button, and the power button hole is 12 millimeters. I like to use a tiny extension cord for the power button in most builds as it's much more convenient to plug in and out. And about the front logo, you're supposed to be able to snap this right into place, but it may or may not require glue depending on your printer's tolerances. I will also make a model of this front panel without the logo for those of you who do not want the logo shown. Now, if we ever need access to the inside, all we need to do is remove the magnetic front panel, just two rear screws at the top, and then everything just slides out, giving us full access to most parts in the build in just seconds. 
I could not be happier with how good this case turned out and how clean it looks in an on-desk setup with all the powerful parts it can hold. Speaking of power, let's look at some performances. First I loaded up Cinebench. In this build we're using an i9-10900K, cooled by a NZXT Z53 240mm AIO liquid cooler and the 10900K stayed around 58 to 59 degrees on full load most of the time. There were occasional peaks up in the low 70s, but this was most likely due to my slow fan curves catching up as they're set to silent mode. During the stress test over time, the temperatures stayed under 60 degrees 99% of the time, which I am more than happy with. These temperatures were recorded with the AIO fans set to intake, sucking air from outside to inside, with an ambient room temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. When loading up Furmark, the Gigabyte 3070 Gaming OC graphics card maxed out at 73 degrees Celsius, which I think is perfectly fine. And honestly, I rarely manage to get this card below 70 degrees in any build, and I don't really expect much lower temperatures from this card with the stock cooling. Overall, the build with this configuration operates relatively quiet and I'm very satisfied with its performance and flexibility. The case really has a minimalistic design that fits into most setups without drawing too much attention while still looking super clean. The features and supported parts in this case were created based on all your feedback in the comments on my previous videos. So please continue letting me know what you'd like to see in future builds down in the comments. And I know I'm not really able to make everyone happy every single time, but believe me when I say I do read all your comments and I try my best to reply to every single one of you. So thank you for all the inspiration and please keep letting me know what you want to see, because the more I see it, the more I want to do it, you know? A small change from my previous videos is that up until now, all my designs have been available to download for free. And what started out as a fun project almost three years ago that I happened to post on Reddit and got some great feedback has now turned into a full channel pretty much dedicated to the subject. As many of you know, designing functional stuff, especially at this scale, can be extremely time consuming. And people have asked me why I'm giving it all away for free. And honestly, it's been because I've felt like the designs weren't good enough to feel confident charging anything for it. But I feel like I've grown a lot over these last years. And I really enjoy doing this, and for me to be able to spend this much time and dedication into the projects, I feel like this is the way to go. Therefore, I've decided to start a printables club, where you can become a member for a small monthly fee. Memberships include access to all STL files from this video, as well as other future projects. You'll also be able to join voting polls, get more frequent updates on projects, and generally have more influence into my decision making, and also more benefits as an advanced member. You'll always be free to leave the club whenever you like if my projects are no longer of interest to you. Or you can stay as a continuous member and increase your loyalty badge if you can afford it and genuinely appreciate my content and want to help me keep this going. I'll leave the choice up to you. Feel free to join my club through the printables link in the video description. And if you want to become a member, simply click on the support and join club icon on my printables profile page. Anyways, member or not, I appreciate you all and thank you so much for watching this video. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already so you don't miss out on my future projects. Thanks again and I hope to see you again in my next video.